2015's Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Bane is incredibly deceptive. Often what's presented directly to the player is merely a pretext, only for later events to contradict. And while it's next to impossible at the end to really be sure of anything that happens in this game, this is a video series trying to do its best to make sense of it. We'll be skipping the beginning in Cyprus until the end, starting instead with Afghanistan. The real Big Boss is working separately from us to create his new nation. New nation? A military nation above and apart from all. The true Outer Heaven. Something created to maintain world balance. Independent of the struggles for supremacy, for personal profit, the cycles of revenge between countries. It'll be an army, all right. But more. Big Boss. He's building a nation. But until it's complete, we support the other big boss. The Phantom carries on his legend, his meme. That is Big Boss's plan. So it's essentially revealed by the end that through the entire game, you're actually playing not as the real big boss, but as his mimetic copy, Venom Snake. Key to the deception is building up a phantom of Big Boss's former private army with his old partner Kazuhira Miller as your number two, your XO. The opening in Cyprus convinces you that, as Ocelot puts it, the whole world wants you dead. At the start of the game, it seems the only person who's on your side, apart from Ocelot, is the man he claims sent Ocelot to Big Boss's rescue, your old partner, Miller. But Miller needs rescue too. After saving him from Soviet torture, together you three begin to build up the strength of a new military without borders, Diamond Dogs. Unlike MSF back in the 70s, Diamond Dogs has no problem working for the US. In Afghanistan, you begin to fight basically as the CIA's proxy to retaliate against the Soviet Union for what they did to the US during Vietnam. Afghanistan is in the midst of a civil war, where both sides are little more than puppets under the control of foreign powers. You gradually begin to learn about what, at first, appears to be secret Soviet research projects. But soon enough, it will be strongly hinted that even the superpowers, the US and the USSR, are functioning as puppets, fighting in a proxy civil war. Behind them both are apparently feuding branches within the same secret entity known as Cypher. The last you heard at the end of Peace Walker, Cypher was the name for the organization formed by your old comrade, Major Zero, following the falling out that you had over Big Boss's clones. And that's how the situation is at first presented in The Phantom Pain. Miller names Zero explicitly. But as you build Diamond Dogs up to fighting strength, Ocelot gradually reveals, in his words, behind Zero there's a void that's even darker. Skullface, commander of the mysterious strike force XOF. You track Skullface to the Serac power plant, but not before taking prisoner an operative with extraordinary abilities. Miller labels Cypher's assassin, the female sniper Quiet. While Quiet is being held for observation, her presence begins to stir up the first signs of discord inside Diamond Dog's body politic. But your focus is shifted onto locating and extracting the fossil from the days of MSF, Huey Emmerich. Cause offhandedly remarks that long before you arrived in country, sightings of Huey are what drew Diamond Dogs to the conflict in this region to begin with. You track Huey to a secret development facility nestled in a cave behind Serac Power Plant, where you encounter two forms of Metal Gears for the first time, Walker Gears and the big weapons platform Sahelanthropus. But according to Ocelot, once Huey is brought to Mother Base for questioning, Funding has actually now been diverted to some other secret project, a so-called weapon to surpass Metal Gear, somewhere in Central Africa. Now given what we later learn about how Venom Snake is not actually Big Boss, it's fascinating to study the first 12 episodes with this secret wider context of shaping a mental copy of Snake in mind. There are shades of Big Boss's past adventures everywhere, which may be signs of this concealed psychological dimension to the game. Notice for just one example that the case for the honeybee kind of looks like the case that the boss 
provided Vulgan at the end of the Virtuous mission from MGS3. And all the missions in the Phantom Pain appear on some level or another to be carefully staged productions in order to allow Venom Snake to think and feel that he's Big Boss for as long as Cypher's various branches need him to be. Exactly as we saw in MGS2 with the Patriots and Dead Cell, the roles in these various productions are all played by actors who think that it's real, namely the Soviets and the Mujahideen. In a way, the entirety of MGSV, from Ground Zeroes to The Phantom Pain, consists of nothing but masterfully hidden variations on the same themes, as a collection of moves playing out within the same sort of chess game. After all, the colonial struggles in Afghanistan that go all the way back to the 19th century have famously been called the Great Game. Now, basically what I'm saying is that there are a lot of very basic questions here if we try to understand what's going on underneath the premises that were fed, that will never be answerable. The storytelling of MGSV is a subversion, I argue, of the very concept of a story. Anytime we try to peel back the facade of it and gaze into truth's abyss, in the words of Orwell's 1984, everything fades into mist. Now, with all this in mind, let's go back to the beginning of Snake's time in Afghanistan for a closer look. The first mission proper is a rescue operation of Miller himself. I was captured by the Soviets. We were on the Zero Line that day, the Afghan side, on our way back from training the Mujahideen at a mountain camp in Kuna province. According to the man himself, he got captured by the mysterious unit known as the Skulls while returning from a training operation in Kunar province. Miller's embedded with the anti-Soviet Jihad there, in direct opposition to the forces associated with the third member of Diamond Dogs, Revolver Shalashaska Ocelot, ostensibly a master interrogator with the Soviet GRU. This training operation takes place at the same time as the events in the very first mission of the game. Miller, unlike the other members of Diamond Dogs with him at the time of his capture, is left alive by the Skulls, who hand him over for interrogation to the Red Army. First we need to save Miller. He's in Afghanistan. Afghanistan? <laughs> Now, due to the clandestine methods Ocelot uses as a triple agent to circumvent prying eyes, Venom Snake winds up in Afghanistan with only three days to save Miller's life. If you're too late, he actually dies in-game waiting to be rescued. Ocelot hints this operation is meant to be merely a warm-up, a reintroduction of the meme of Big Boss on the world stage. You're a legend in the eyes of those who live on the battlefield. That's why you have to handle this mission yourself. Put those nine years behind you, and return this big boss. Boss, your mission is to rescue the target Kazuhira Miller, the man you called your partner nine years ago. Miller was training guerrilla rebels near the Pakistani border when he was captured by the Soviets. He's currently being held at Dawan Dehar. Rescue Miller from the Soviet troops and extract him by chopper. It's time to prove to the world you're the real big boss. This will just be the first of many stories that will be recounted over the coming years as legend. As Venom Snake, the player is given the proper time during this mission to adjust to the Phantom Pain and learn the basics of its open world infiltration. As veterans of the series may already recognize, this appears to be a test similar to the Fat Man encounter from MGS2 Sons of Liberty, only by passing this test in the form of saving Miller and surviving what turns out to be an ambush by the Skulls, do events proceed further, presumably as they've been prearranged to. When Snake wakes up, and he will, he'll need your help again. So when he does, I promise you'll be the first to know. The code phrase will be, V has come to. I'll then mobilize all the necessary parties. Think of it as an overture to a prologue. V has come to. 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 V
V has come to. There's already just too much to unpack before we can speculate over the distinction between ruse and reality in MGSV. So let's dive in. Miller later explains that he intentionally took on the training op as a dangerous high-profile assignment in order to cover your hospital escape. He's a decoy, in other words, claiming that the forces hunting for you, presumably the organization Cypher, couldn't be sure that wherever Miller might show up, that you might not show up too. Cypher's name is spoken whenever convenient to direct your animosity outside your own organization. The word becomes synonymous with a boogeyman, a phantom who's both everywhere and nowhere. You see, Cypher as an organization, as a word, has been confusingly split across multiple meanings and identities in this game. There's Cypher as in Skullface. The female sniper. Quiet. Cypher's assassin. That's step one to tracking down Skullface. And Cypher with him. Good luck, boss. Cypher as in the Patriot AIs. It was Anderson after all. That's right, the man who went by SIGINT during Operation Snake Eater. Following Zero's disappearance, he's taken over command of Cypher. Well, to be precise, the AI he oversees has. And they've got a name for Anderson's AI project. It's called the Patriots. And in fact, there's a strong possibility there's even a third Cypher as in the secret plan that Zero sets into motion to preserve Big Boss's meme until the real Big Boss can return. One more thing. A proposition. Yes. I've prepared a ruse of sorts, one I imagine you'll quite like. What is it? You could say I've made another snake. Major. I'm not talking about the children. A mental copy. His phantom if you like. I don't understand. You will when you get to Cyprus. It seems throughout MGSV that there is an internal power struggle going on, with all three sides confusingly being called Cypher. What about him? <sighs> Miller was in contact with Cypher nine years ago. He was working with them. He's the traitor, Snake! Clearly an AI couldn't be allowed to make its own decisions. So they would take away its ability to act, and instead create a specialized system in which the AI, bound by specific rules, filters the massive amounts of data it collects before passing it on to people, subtly guiding their decision-making. Cypher will rewrite the records, and I will vanish from human memory. But the thirst for revenge that I have planted will infest the system! No one can stop it now! Sahalanthropus will unleash that thirst unto the future! Major, I'm burning As I'll try to explain throughout these videos, it seems that the cipher of the Patriot AIs is the world order that the fake Big Boss is truly meant to deceive. It seems as though Cypher as the Phantom of Zero and Cypher as the organization run by Skullface are in some sort of battle over the hearts and minds of the cipher that is the Patriot AIs. At least that's my theory. But first, Venom Snake, as I said, has to save Miller before he can truly become the meme of Big Boss. Now, Miller helps establish a scenario whereby the Skulls use him as bait, something the players left to put together for ourselves. As soon as we think that we've evaded the enemy with Miller in tow, the Skulls and their strange mist blots out the area just as it blots out our comprehension the first time through. 
clearly they aren't part of the Red Army. Later, we'll see them turn Soviet troops into the unit's own apparent zombies. It's strongly hinted that the Skulls are in league with one entity alone, Cypher, as in Skullface's Cypher, and his version or branch of the organization. Now, encountering the Skulls for the first time provides a ton of encouragement for what happens next. Not only do the Skulls make it clear that Diamond Dogs has to get stronger before trying to get their revenge, the Skulls also demonstrate there's a lot that you don't know and will need to find out before that revenge can take place. Who are they, and if they're part of Cypher, what's Cypher doing in Afghanistan? These are the mysteries that the first third of The Phantom Pain is all about. Well, the answers to these questions have to do, at least in part, with Huey, the former MSF engineer, who Miller and Ocelot, right or wrong, will come to completely blame for the attack on Mother Base in 1975. But before we get to Huey, the first few missions in The Phantom Pain are more warm-ups. C2W, for example, introduces the key theme of information warfare, but the actual requirements for this mission are fairly simple. It's over the fence and a hero's way that really keep the story going albeit mostly through foreshadowing. In Over the Fence, you're tasked with rescuing a Soviet engineer that directly foreshadows what's to come with Huey. The man who resembles Breaking Bad's Walter White somewhat is a former Soviet specialist who got caught trying to defect from a later setting in the game where we'll find Huey, the main Soviet base camp. And this theme of a Soviet scientist trying to defect is of course a nod to the events of the virtuous mission in MGS3. Now, as far as I can tell, this engineer is the first of several key intel sources who confesses things to you that the game will refuse to translate until you reach some later point. Even if you already have a Russian interpreter. The reason seems to have to do with Metal Gear, whose development is still a secret at this juncture. It also seems to have to do with how much the Soviet bionics engineer hints towards the secret that Diamond Dogs is already somewhat part of Cypher, too. That's the target. Looks like we found him. It's about this. Yeah, he voice Jello. It's a motion devil. But don't you find it strange? A PF employed by the West obtains a prototype developed by the Soviets. Eastern weapons technology developed in Afghanistan is being supplied to the West. Only Cypher would be capable of making something like that happen. Later on, Miller will self-righteously say only Cypher could be behind the transfer of Soviet technology into Western-backed hands. And yet your prosthetic hand is an example of exactly this and we're told that you obtained it by way, of course, of Ocelot. And it was no mean feat to get hold of Snake's arm. I couldn't get one for you at the time, but you know, now, forget it. Once the engineer's words are properly translated, we find that he defected when, instead of being rewarded for his work on the very prosthetic hand that you're using now, which he calls his masterpiece, the Kremlin instead reassigned him to provide giant hands for a new weapons platform, presumably Metal Gear Sahelanthropus. Another reason his intel gets suppressed here may be how the bionics engineer offhandedly reveals that Sahelanthropus, in the words of Huey later on, is a paper tiger, that it has no intrinsic military value, as the engineer calls it a wind-up toy. Besides, it's still just an incomplete prototype at this point and nothing but a paper tiger. Even if it can walk, it's far from being a viable weapons platform. It wouldn't be useful in actual battle. We'll come back to this later when we get to my wider theory about the truth behind Skullface and his scheming. So that'll have to do for now. Now the next key foreshadowing mission is A Hero's Way. In A Hero's Way, we're told that a Spetsnaz commander has been involved in a Soviet scorched earth campaign that's rumored to have resulted in the eradication of the Hamid fighters in Desmase Laman Fort overnight. Initially, you might assume that these rumors come from the Mujahideen, but during the commander's little speech, he reveals it is actually within the Soviets' own ranks that these rumors are spreading. Похоже, гражданским тоже досталось. Ходят слухи, 
что это постарались наши. Так вот, это грязная ложь. This suggests, if it wasn't already obvious, that Diamond Dogs, through probably Revolver Ocelot, has penetrated the Soviet ranks. Anyway, it turns out that the commander has nothing to do with Dismasi Laman, just as that so-called mechanical engineer was actually a bionics engineer, which Miller neglects to correct until the mission's end. The target's an engineer. A mechanical engineer, to be precise. The guys on the R&D team are glad to have him aboard. The thing is, his specialty is in mechanics, but something called bionics, engineering based on biology. Farming villages in southern Vahan have been subjected to a strategic bombing campaign the past several weeks. The damage is spreading. It's part of the Soviet scorched earth operation aimed at wiping out the guerrillas. The target this time is the commander of a Spetsnaz detachment. He's been key to the operation's success. People say this guy's responsible for annihilating the Mujahideen at Dismasi Laman. The purpose of A Hero's Way seems merely to be about presenting the mystery of Dismasi Laman, where the region's minority, Pashto speaking Hamid guerrillas vanish without a trace overnight. Presumably this happened sometime in between your rescuing of Miller and the mission A Hero's Way. Next comes Where Do the Bees Sleep? Mission 6, which finally reunites us with the white whale of MGSV proper, Skullface. Yet again, we seem to walk straight into a trap that involves the skulls, as Skullface and his skulls await outside the fort we just mentioned, the Smase Laman. But we're also introduced, again only through a hint, to the presence in Afghanistan of a Metal Gear. The Metal Gear will eventually come to call Sahelanthropus. And yet another hint to the vocal cord parasites by way of the voiceless Mujahideen. And finally, we're also introduced here to the puppet or zombie-like transformation that the skulls can cause in the Soviet forces, which temporarily turns them into what look to be phantoms of Skullface himself. Whoever gave the Hamid the honeybee shortly before they were all wiped out by the parasites set the stage perfectly for the ambush on Venom Snake by Skullface that happens at the end of the mission. There is no way that Venom Snake could resist this premise of a secret CIA weapon that was about to fall into the hands of the Soviets in an abandoned fort, surrounded by rumors and disappearances. It's also worth noting that the mute Hamid foreshadows quiet. If you'll notice, gradually we're becoming like dogs hunting after the fox-like scent of Skullface and Cypher. After a few missions, mainly relating only to the war in Afghanistan, we come to the next big story mission that we find their scent in, Angel with Broken Wings. Angel with Broken Wings is one of the most deceptive missions thus far. It begins with the premise that the target, Malak, has been contracted for rescue by a survivor of an airstrike on his village. Malak is moved from Lamar Hate to Yako Obo Supply Outpost for interrogation. It seems to be yet another case of the Soviet's scorched earth campaign that destroyed Malak's village. However, it's soon revealed that the village, much like the Dismasi Laman fort, fell victim to some kind of disease. That target you extracted, Malak, is saying that he's never heard of our client. What's more, he says his village was destroyed long before he was ever taken prisoner. Apparently it fell victim to some sort of disease, then was completely burned to the ground. Malik was out on a mission at the time, and that's the reason why he alone survived. But the question is, who hired us to find him? According to Malik, he saw strange soldiers snooping around the village when he got back. Turns out they were members of Cypher Strike Force XOF. So there's a lot going on in this mission. For one, Miller's whole cover story that was ostensibly provided by the client, who Malak reveals at the end he's never heard of, conceals a key reference to liquid speech at the end of MGS-1. The client is none other than his father. Yeah. Or rather, this was his father's dying wish. A world where warriors like us are honored as we once were, as we should be. That was Big Boss's fantasy. It was his dying wish. 
The title, meanwhile, Angel with Broken Wings, seems to be an allusion to the devil, a malak or angel who, in the Judeo-Christian and Islamic faiths, fell from grace and metaphorically could no longer fly in heaven. This in turn speaks to MGSV's symbolism as a whole in its depiction of Big Boss's own demonic fall from grace, and it also somewhat speaks to the themes of a very important reference point for the game, 1984, given that, much like how that novel depicts former allies suddenly betraying each other and becoming enemies, God and the devil used to be on the same side. Much like the US and the Soviet Union. Much like the US and the so-called Mujahideen or Jihad movement. So we already have a lot of connections here to the larger story and the larger themes, and the larger connections that it wants to make to real-world history. Lamar Hate Palace is a kind of phantom of Camp Omega, a black site, as Miller tells us, where both real and suspected guerrillas are held for questioning, only to be disappeared. This yet again hints to the other wider theme of a disguised one-party, one-world system. Both East and West are apparently using similar if not identical tactics, not to mention gear like Snake's prosthesis. Cos, it's me. I'm here to get you out. Snake. They do something to your eyes? No, it's... It's just bright as all. From the very first moment between the player and cause, we're being lied to. Hell, even the premise that Miller created a diversion to keep you safe was also probably a lie. Just because Miller, or for that matter Ocelot in the opening, or quiet against that Soviet jet, seem to do something that saves your life does not mean they're actually on your side. The boss's biggest ideal was loyalty, yet tragically, in the world that's being built in MGSV, nothing and no one is as they seem. There are constant lies in MGSV, lies that help push you along and maintain the little fictions that serve the status quo. Behind the drapery, so to speak, everyone seems to have their own agenda. This is what makes any definitive account impossible. All we can demonstrate conclusively is how and when the lies are told. In A Hero's Way, Miller implies that the Hamid fighters at Desmas Le Mans were killed in Scorched Earth-style strategic bombing, but in Episode 6 we're told there's no trace of fighting at the fort, so why mention Desmas Le Mans in A Hero's Way at all? Wouldn't Miller have known that it wouldn't have been possible to explain what happened there with a Soviet Scorched Earth campaign? Then there's the question of who commissioned the rescue of Malik. During the mission, Diamond Dogs puts together a new premise that the people who wanted Malak back were actually Cypher, trying to tie up loose ends. But this doesn't really make sense to me either. Miller, despite telling the client through a cutout that Malak was killed in action, still receives payment. Could it be that recovering Malak and learning about the burned village and the mysterious disease and hearing from Malak about XOF were all part of the real purpose of this mission? Cypher's obviously up to something. It's heavily implied that Malak is handed over to Diamond Dogs to feed the fire for revenge as a character in a stimulating story about his destroyed village. The father's dying words were, before you take revenge for our people, save my son. This story is what gives you yet another motivation for vengeance against who you presume to be the single lone entity named Cypher. Little do you realize, ever, at least outright, that you, Miller, and Diamond Dogs as a whole are arguably already part of the very Leviathan that you quest to destroy. This somewhat reminds me of the Joachim Mogren ruse of Moby Dick Studios that Kojima used to promote this game, whereby Mr. Mogren abruptly leaves the interview when questioned about the obvious presence in the trailer of the Fox Engine logo. Oh wow, those look like some new screens. Oh, the main character. So these are screenshots. I know there's a, a Fox Engine logo in the corner, so this game is running on the Fox Engine. There's some heavy denial, fragility, and self-induced repression going on, in other words. This kind of repression is a major motif in The Phantom Pain. We'll also get to how The Phantom Pain can also not only represent a pain that isn't there, but a pain that isn't known about, a pain that's been repressed, that the world is blind to, pain like Malak's. 
What's very easy to miss is the little side narrative in this mission involving Malak's driver. The driver pities the POW and actually shows concern about Malak getting medical attention. Along the route from Lamar Hate to Wak Sind, we learn that the Soviet doctors are doing autopsies on all POWs they examine alive or dead, presumably to investigate the earliest signs in the game of a mysterious fatal disease that may be weaponized, which Malak's driver and a guard discuss. This seems to be a follow-up on the events of Mission 6, Where Did the Bees Sleep? The driver of the armored escort vehicle, meanwhile, even says that he witnessed Malak's village firsthand and that it definitely wasn't an airstrike that burned it down. Though Miller will later claim XOF were responsible, the other driver also mentions a rumor that the man we know as the Man on Fire was responsible. What really makes the initial premise that Malak's village was targeted by the Soviets' scorched earth campaign obviously untrue is that the Soviets don't interrogate Malak for information on the Mujahideen at all. Rather, they question him about the village, which of course they wouldn't need to do if the Soviets were in fact the ones responsible for burning it down. Finally, there's a subtle nod to the events of Chico's tapes from Ground Zeroes, when the driver lies to Malak, hoping to make the POW talk willingly and save himself more potentially life-threatening pain. The driver tells Malak in Russian that he's heard that Malak's family actually survived, perhaps to try and give the POW a reason to live and to cooperate. The only question that no one can answer here is why doesn't a Pashto strain of the parasite spread by way of Malak through Mother Base? My guess is that Malak must have been away from the village the whole time doing missions, fighting the Soviets, and only came back after it had been infected and burned to the ground. We're later told that both Dasmasi Laman and Malak's village were testing grounds for Skullface's vocal cord parasites. It will also later be revealed that Skullface's experiments on Pashtuns in northern Afghanistan, which resulted in both cases in genocide, were ironically in pursuit of a deterrent against ethnic cleansing. Skullface uses the vocal cord parasites project long abandoned by Cypher's predecessor, the Philosophers, to cover his true objective of creating an English strain. Skullface's true goal seems to be to exterminate English as a lingua franca for the world, replacing it with nukes and metal gears. Wiping out the Hamid fighters in Dismasi Laman was merely a test to see if language targeting really worked. The reasoning behind wiping out Malak's village, on the other hand, is much harder to answer. Supposedly, it was about obtaining samples of the infected, or so Code Talker tells us, and in this regard, he claims it was a failure. But when we compare what he says that he heard Skullface say to every piece of evidence that we can find for ourselves in Angel with Broken Wings, it's clear that someone is lying. Malak's village was definitely not wiped out by a standard Soviet scorched earth operation. What seems like the likeliest explanation here is that the man on fire attacked Malak's village first, and then XOF showed up only afterwards to make sure either everyone was dead or, in addition, that Malak got a good look at them to spread the word to Diamond Dogs. If, as I'll argue in detail later on, part of how all the various factions within Cypher converge is over the proliferation of the virtue called revenge, letting Malak and Diamond Dogs find an enemy that they hold in common would be imperative. And as for Code Talker, he may have merely omitted the involvement of the Man on Fire for the sake of brevity, or, as we'll see later, maybe due to something much more sinister. But more on all that in a later episode. But what's important is how missions even outside the main story follow along a chain of cause and effect. Mission 7, Red Brass, is a consequence of Diamond Dogs building up its Afghan presence, for example. And in Mission 8, a colonel has been reassigned to occupy Dismasi Laman following the events of Mission 6, which of course were in turn foreshadowed by Episode 3. Next, after several missions relating mainly only to the Soviet-Afghan War, we come to the two final story-heavy missions in Afghanistan for now, Cloaked in Silence and Hellbound. Cloaked in Silence begins with a 9-11-esque surprise attack, if you will. 
a Pearl Harbor, which throws you into combat with the female sniper, Quiet. Quiet is like a bad memory you just can't shake, as she's the same assassin who came for you in Cyprus at the very start. Except then, she got up close and personal, and now she's fighting you with long-range, long guns. I don't have much to say about Quiet just yet, except to point out that, like during Where Do the Bee Sleep, you're given, by way of Miller and Ocelot, two diametrically opposing possible outcomes to explore here, almost like an experiment into which one that you'll willingly pick. Now you just need to bring it back. Call the chopper from your iDroid. You are not to use the honeybee. Those skulls are too fast. You got a holy weapon. Boss, maybe it's time to see what the honeybee can do. <laughs> now we're talking. We can forget about that bonus now. She's one of the skulls. Hurry up and kill her. No. Killing her would be a waste. Bring her back here. What this may entail, and what it paves the way for, the rescue of Huey and the move by Diamond Dogs to Central Africa, will all have to wait until the following episode. That is, of course, if this video gets enough likes and support. Until next time, boss.